Welcome to our Shepherd's Chapel Bible Study. It's so great that you could all join us today. Please join us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings, all the blessings. Our cups truly do runneth over and before the camera comes on and and, and before we come together or as we come together, we, we mention occasionally of certain things that are happening in our lives and, and those that affect our lives and and those that we affect and we know it's it's all in your hands father and we thank you for that we thank you for taking a personal interest in our lives which you said you would and and we deeply emotionally prayerfully thank you for that we also have these unspoken prayers before you at this time you know every heart every dream every every concern father and we know that you hear every single prayer. And we also know that you always answer every single prayer. But it's not in our time frame, as it shouldn't be. But it is in your time frame. And this is what we're learning. Patience and, and many things along the way. And we thank you for that. We also pray, dear Lord, for Rachel, Faye, Mrs. Holden, Jody, and all the caregivers, Father, that, that help them, that are behind the scenes, Father, that every day, day in and day out, they're there helping. And we thank you for each and every one of them, Father. We also pray for Lanny and Cindy. On all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. And as always, Father, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, wherever they are, whatever they are doing, we pray for their safety and speedy return to the sheepfold. And we pray, dear Lord, for Israel and our nation, knowing that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders every day they are on the front lines helping your children, as well as our military who are in arms way, or who are about to go into arms way, for their safety and speedy return home. And as always, Father, we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive that truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see. I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, we're getting back into our Father's word, and um, we finished our... Uh, lessons about um, faith last week um, or teachings on it or Bible studies on it but <clears throat> there was a certain passage now well, before I go there the, the word I want to cover today and what I want to look at is diligently because it's a really a follow-up with faith um, the word diligently is written 1,210 times in the Bible. And uh, it's not like faith where it's, what, 17,000 or whatever. But still, we're not going to be able to cover 1,000 verses today. Uh, but we don't need to uh, because our Father will give us a, a, a very well understanding of this word. But it's an important word, and it really follows after faith. Uh, the word, the world definition of diligently says, in a way that shows care and conscientiousness in one's work or duties. Now that's a worldly look at it. Now, uh, in the Greek manuscript, in the Greek manuscript, it's written as spoudē, and the definition of diligently spoudē in Greek is haste, earnestness, enthusiasm. Okay. Now, also, um, in Proverbs 11.27, it says, He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. So basically, our Father is telling us, through his word, that you get what you want. And isn't that what our Father does? He, he gives you what you want. If you, if you want to 
<coughs> earnestly seek after him and know and understand him and understand his word and and to be a true Christian, learn how, what it means to be a true Christian and do it, uh, he will give you the tools that you need to learn how to do that. However, if you don't want no part of it, guess what? He allows you not to have any part of it. He gives you what you want. You want to live in the world and the way the world is? The world right now is suffering. Everybody in this world right now is suffering that are of the world. In other words, they're not... They have not come to the understanding of our Father. They don't want anything to do with Him. They say they do, but if they did, then they would do what He wants done. And what does He want for us? He, what does He want from us? Our love. That's all He wants. Well, is that too much to give your Creator? You know, no, of course not. Now, some people say, well, what does it say in the Hebrew? Well, the Hebrew... Uh, word for diligently is osparna, and it means one word thoroughly thoroughly so last week during our teachings on faith we came to Hebrews 11 6 and I'll remind you where it said but without faith it is impossible to please him being God for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, it's not just those that seek him, but those that diligently seek him. And, and that, that got my mind racing. I think it was the Spirit of God wanting me to go into this a little bit deeper. Because it seems to me that some people seek the Lord in one way, but they don't diligently seek the Lord because that's the requirement of the Lord if you if you want it all you've got to do things his way not your way and a lot of people want to do things their own way at their own time frame they want to what I call God in the box they want you know God not to interfere in their lives until they need him well I don't know about you but the thing is I need him every second of every moment of every day and he knows that and uh, but some people just want to pull them out when things are bad, things are get tough, and uh, so this is what I, I have been led today to search out with you. So, what does our Father mean when He wants us to diligently seek Him? Now we can use the definition, but I want to cover it in Scripture. Uh, so let's begin today. I want to go to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. You're all there already? Oh, well, that's really good. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1, and it reads, <clears throat> With wisdom from our Heavenly Father. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue, that's the rest, of the elders which were carried away captives. Remember, they were taken to Babylon. And to the priest and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is a letter that he wrote to them. Why well, he's still in Jerusalem. Why he's still in Jerusalem. This word, Nebuchadnezzar, let him stay, right? Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Verse 2. After that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. That's when they were... They, remember, they took what uh, they believed all the uh, higher hierarchy of the people that could do the construction and the educators and all that to Babylon. Left who behind? Well, they thought they were leaving behind just the the uh, run-of-the-mill kind of people to just take care of the land and you know keep the buildings going and that sort of thing. But that, our father had more involved. Mm -hmm. Verse three: By the hand of Eliza, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, the son of Helkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, Judea, sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon saying, I know that's a long presentation, but saying, this is the letter, 
Verse 4, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. See, this isn't, this isn't coming from Jeremiah. This is coming directly from the Lord. The God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Who caused it? Jeremiah? No. Our father caused it. Why? Why did he cause them to go into captivity? Disobedience. Disobedience. I mean, remember, they were supposed to be God's priests. They were supposed to, to follow God and then teach his word and, and, and all this, but they brought in what? Other idols and they did everything just like the heathen were doing, basically. And God gave them plenty of chances. Now, now some people say, no, wait a minute now, this is Old Testament stuff, and this is talking about Israel being taken in captive. Well, that's true, but is this not supposed to be for our ammunition, as it says, our examples? Well, why would this be an example for us today? Huh. Well, this, this particular word here, being captive. Well, you can be captive by the world. Exactly. I mean, are there people captive today? Yes. I can see every time I go out of this house and look at people, I see a lot of people captive. And I don't even need to hear from them anymore. I can see what they're doing and tell that they're captive. And that's true. And people don't understand this. People are scared to death out there. All because of what they're hearing from the world hearing from the people of the world, hearing from the leaders of the world, hearing from the religion of the world, the economy of the world, the political of the world. And they're, they're just so twisted and just tense and worried and scared. And, and Oh, my goodness. I haven't gotten on the Internet, but, of course, Donna spends a considerable amount of time and she tells me all the crap. I laugh because it's funny to me, but it's not funny to them. But I laugh at the craziness that's going on in there. And what people are saying towards one another and about other people and about themselves. And that's the most disconcerting part for me. That this camp and that camp are against each other. And... In one particular camp, if you're not masked up, gloved up, and staying in your house, you're out to kill us. Mm -hmm. So it's just from one extreme to the other extreme. And, mm -hmm. and then you got some standing there in front of the courthouse with M16. I so know, right? You seen some of that <laughs> stuff going on? Ross is the cop saying to you cuff them. No, you cuff them. <laughs> All the sheriffs, the sheriffs are coming out now uh, because... Some preachers, finally, yeah. I don't even know if I want to call them preachers, but some of them are finally saying, well, we don't know, our First Amendment rights are being trampled on, and, and we're, we're, gonna, we're going to open up our churches again. Not that they've done it yet. They're waiting on permission. They're, they're going, and the sheriffs are coming out in some of these counties saying, hey, they do, we're not going to arrest anybody. Yeah. Well, yeah. Greg Newman, who's the district attorney for no the names. county, I'm yeah. sorry. The district attorney for all the counties in our surrounding area came out the other day. This barber finally opened his shop, and they gave him two warnings, and he ignored them. And so finally, somebody called in on him, and the district attorney was really kind of ticked because somebody made the call. He said, "I'm not going to arrest the man for trying to make a living," and that's just how it is in our area. Well, it's not just your area; it's the whole country. I don't know about the rest of the world, but from what I've seen, the whole country. So, the thing, thing that's most disappointing is that a lot of these people call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to, yeah. They don't have a clue. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the bottom line is we can all agree that people are captive today. Mm -hmm. Even though this was written thousands of years ago about what was taking place, same thing today. There's no difference. There's nothing new under the sun. Exactly. Verse 5. What does the Lord tell them to do? Build ye houses. Now, this is those that are in captivity. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. In other words, carry on with your lives. Six, take ye wives, and beget, beget sons and daughters. Now, he's not telling them to take the wives of the heathen. No. He's talking within, within the uh, 
um, community. community of Israel. And, and now, why is that important to keep the seed line going? Now, a lot of people say, "Well, you're you're being prejudiced in this." And that. No, this is this comes from our Father. He wanted us to stay with a certain bloodline to keep that bloodline flowing. You know. He's not telling us to love, not love other people, but he's saying, look, if you're going to take people in as, as husbands and wives, keep it in the community. And take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. In other words, just because you're in captivity doesn't mean that you should, shouldn't still flourish. Now keep that in mind. No, people are captive today. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't still be flourishing. Well, they're not flourishing today because they're listening not to God. They're listening to the world. Seek, uh, verse 7, And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captive. To what? Seek the peace of Babylon? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? He says, and how do you do this? And pray unto the Lord for it. Pray for what? Peace. Now what should people be doing today without all this, this mumbo-jumbo and the worried and frustrated? What aren't they doing? I don't, I don't need to figure, you know, I'm not God, but I can see with my own eyes, people are not praying for peace today. Better said, very, very few are. Well, they and, are. Huh? They are. Who are? People are praying for peace. Really? Yes. Are they seeking it? They're praying for their own peace. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Well, that's a good, good example. Praying for themselves. Their own peace. Their way. In other words, they're bring, trying to bring God out of the box. Right. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace, if you do it God's way. But you're not going to have peace doing it your own way. That's a good example, son. And the, and the fact is, you're not going to have that example. I mean, the example that you're given by our Father, just like what Donald was saying earlier about having uh, people uh, that are self-proclaimed Christians, doing things their own way. Well, can you call them Christian? Well, they call themselves Christian. What does Christian mean? Christ man, Christ woman of God. In other words, they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But that's where it stops with them. They don't want to go into the... They don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to roll up their sleeves in the Word of God and start studying to show thyself approved as uh, the Lord teaches us in, in Mark 13, I think it's 23. You know... I have foretold you all things, he says there. You know, I have taught you all things. Well, to teach you all things means that you've covered the work Thoroughly. with understanding. In other diligently. words, diligently. diligently. Just not that one time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, verse 8. Mm -hmm. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you Deceive you. What? Neither hearken to your dreams, which ye cause to be dreamed. So what is he talking about here? We shouldn't listen to preach and know your prophets and your diviners. Who are these? They're false prophets. Diviners meaning they make things up as they go along. They, 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 just like all these self-proclaimed preachers, and I call them self-proclaimed preachers today, which I kind of got on last week at the end of our, our lecture, where I said, shame on you for being closed on the highest of all holiest of days. You know, and I saw one just last night on the boob tube saying, well, we would open, but a lot of our congregation are elderly people, and, and they're the ones that can be most exposed. Now, the guy sitting on his butt drawing a payroll from, from his church is what he's doing, where he doesn't have to teach anymore. That's his problem, you know. You say, well, you're being pretty hard. No. You wait till Father gets a hold of their tail. Then they're going to really understand. And I pray some of them really awaken out of all this and realize what's going on. So these are the false preachers and the false teachers. Verse 9. 
for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. I never sent them. Well, who did? Well, if you're not walking with God, who are you working with? There's mm -hmm. only two. Verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years, now he gives them a time frame here, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. In other words, after a generation, I'll come to you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place, being Jerusalem. In other words, after a generation, after 70 years, I'm going to cut you loose. doesn't matter what Babylon wants. It's what God wants. Now, in other words, why after a generation? Because it took a generation to get their attention. Now, I pray it doesn't take a generation to get the world's attention today. Because if it is, now this is only after a couple months. Can you imagine after 70 years? Mm. But you know what? I would not put it past the Lord to allow that to happen. It could happen. I don't think it will. I think come June 1st, everything's going to open up, whether they want to or not. Verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. And what is it? Thoughts of peace. And not of evil. To give you an expected end. In other words, I do all this. I put you in captivity to get your attention. Why? For your expected end. In other words, I have an expectation of you that you're going to make it. That you're going to understand. You're going to realize the error of your ways. And you're going to turn from those idols. You're going to turn from the worldly worship. And you're going to start worshiping me. So that I can bring you to my eternal home with me. That's the expected end. That's why he created you. He didn't create anybody to die. But there's certain things that a person must do <coughs> in life to learn how to make it to eternity. But he's given us how to do it in his word. That's why it says, after all this, in verse 12 it says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Meaning what? After you learn all this stuff, after you realize the error of your ways, after you repent, you know, and understand that, hey, I only want the best for you. And if you just listen to what I'm giving you in my word, I've sent you prophets. I've sent you Jesus. I've sent you the disciples. It's all written down for you. All you have to do is not just read it, but you've got to study it. Diligently study my word to understand what I'm telling you, and then do what it says. That's what he's saying. And verse 13 says this, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. That's another word, meaning mine, but that also means searching what? Diligently. Diligently, thoroughly, with enthusiasm. To find God, one must seek Him. But you will not find Him unless you diligently seek Him. Meaning, thoroughly, with enthusiasm, with all your heart. Also translated as mind. No, instead of just playing church. Playing the game with God. You can't play these games with God because he's the heart knower. All this that comes out of your mouth is one thing, but you know what? He knows what you're thinking before it ever comes out of your mouth. One more example. I want to go to the New Testament now since a lot of people don't want to listen to the Old. I want to go to Mark. Mark chapter 2. Gives us a good example here about what it really means to diligently seek Him. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Blow those pages. <laughs> Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again, He, being Jesus, entered into Capernaum after some days, 
and it was noised or it was reported that he was in the house. Now the house that he was in in Capernaum, basically the house that he was in was Peter's house. Uh, whenever he went to Capernaum, Peter was the house that he would stay at when he was in Capernaum. Two, and straightway or immediately, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. In other words, he's sitting in Peter's house, probably in the, in the farthest room back, or if there's only one room, I don't know, it doesn't say. But he's all the way back there, and it's just elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder people going all the way out the door. And he's preaching to them. A massive crowd here. Verse 3. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. Now, palsy is a medical term which refers to various types of paralysis. This guy, he, he couldn't walk at all. Why does it say, which was born of four? In other words, he was on what we call a stretcher today. Uh, you know, the handle's coming out, mm -hmm. and a guy here, a guy here, and a guy there, a guy there, and this guy is paralyzed. He's laying on this stretcher. Oh, well, think about it. They go up to this house, and there's nothing but a massive amount of people. Now, how are they going to get a stretcher through all those people? I guess they could yell at them or something and get them out of the way, but they didn't do that. What did they do? Verse 4. And when they could not come nigh, when they couldn't get near unto him, being Jesus, for the press, the, the crowd of the people, they uncovered the roof. They went up to the roof. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. In other words, now, they didn't just go up to the roof and put a hold on there and say, Hey, Jesus, we got somebody for you. No, this guy was on a stretcher. He's probably six foot long, if not with a little bit of the handles, and three to four feet wide. They didn't just put a little hole in his roof. They tore Peter, Peter's roof up to the point where they could put a whole man down with a stretcher, and they brought him down right in front of Jesus. That's why it says, five, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, we're not going to get into the why he said, Your sins have been forgiven thee, because it sounds like this man had sins, that which called his paralysis. But, again, Christ did the healing. That's the bottom line here. But it was their faith in him that made the man sick of the palsy whole. But, don't overlook this. They were not going to be held back by any crowd. No matter what, they were they diligently sought the Lord, thoroughly with enthusiasm. And, and nothing, absolutely nothing was going to cease them for having this guy go before the Lord. They were just certain that if they could just get him there. Yeah, no doubt. And the Bible's full of these, you know, which we're not going to cover them all today. But it kind of re reminds me of this thing that I was given, a story that there was this family. I mean, I would call them a Christian family, but uh, the way they put it, well, we're religious but not practicing. And uh, in other words, they knew of God, they accepted Christ and all that. Well, it was a fairly good, uh, I think they had three kids, and... Um, the youngest boy, who was at this point was young enough to come and go pretty much on his own, but uh, within, boundaries. within boundaries. Anyways, at certain times, a couple times a week, he'd disappear. He'd be gone. And they didn't think much of it because, you know, this would happen quite a lot with him. But one day that he came in and um, they asked him, well, where have you been? He didn't want to tell them. He says, look, you... Now, if you want to go outside this house, you better tell us where you're going. He said, all right. He says, I've been going to church. <laughs> and the mother was raised her eyebrows. The father was there. And they said to him, well, uh, why didn't you tell us you were going to church? He says, because I was embarrassed. And the mother said, well, what are you embarrassed for? We we believe in God and, and, and all that. And... 
we're, we're all Christians. We're not practicing, but we're all Christians. And, and they told me, you don't have to be embarrassed about going to church. And she says, you know, I, I've been around quite a few years. I, I know some stuff. He's, she says, if, if you've got any questions about anything, you know, let me know. And he thought for a second. He goes, well, I do have one big question. And she says, well, what is that? Let me know. And he says, what's the meaning of life? And the mother uh, looked at the father, and the father looked at the mother, and, and she says, well, you know, I don't really know. She goes, but I do know where the answer is. She says, it's in the Bible. And he says, great. So she goes up to the bookcase, and way up at the top, they've they got that big family Bible, and she got it down, <coughs> blew the dust off of it, you know, and opened it up, and, and she, she took it over to, to Genesis, you know, and she goes, well, here it is. It's right here in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. She thought for a second, well, well that's not the meaning of life. And she goes, and then it says this, and it says this. And she, she, keep, and she goes over a couple other pages, and, and then, well, that ain't that either, you know. And, she, and then she goes, and, and, um, and oh, she goes, and, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And he goes, well, that's not the meaning of life. And she goes, well, no, I guess it isn't. You know, now, now, what's the meaning of this story? I know you're looking, well, where is he going with this? Well, the fact of the matter is, when one diligently seeks after the Lord, doesn't mean that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You know that there is a Bible. But what it means is that to understand all these things in life, such as the meaning of life, why you're here, why you were created, you've got to study the Word of God. The Be word. Because the Word does tell us because what the meaning is. created for His pleasure. Well, yeah, it does say that. But some people even then say, well, what do you mean for his pleasure? You know, why are we created for his pleasure and because not our own? Because he's the Father. <laughs> well, that's true. He is the Father. We are created to serve, not be served. Ah, exactly. So, now how did you learn that, son? Study. In the Word. You know, in other words, you diligently, believe it or not, you diligently sought after the answers. <coughs> and we all have questions in life, and understandably, you know. And there's a lot of things that we can't answer about life. However, what our Father said in His Word, that He has given us all that we need to know how to receive the eternal kingdom, how to get there. You know, which means it may not answer every one of our questions that we will ultimately come up with. And I guess we all have some of those that until we get to the kingdom, we just can't have answered yet because it's just not in the realm of flesh. I have several of those. But I do know one thing. I know enough now how to get there. And when I screw up, which we all do, I can repent. Why? Because of Jesus. Now, how do I know that? Because I've read it. I studied it. I understand it. You know. So, coming out the gate, how does one diligently seek after the Lord? I want to go to a place, actually, one of these verses I keep in my wallet 24-7. Uh, and I want to go there. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter seven. I keep verse fourteen in my wallet all the time, but I don't want to start there. I want to start with verse twelve to answer the question: How does one diligently seek the Lord? Verse twelve says, "And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night." In other words, this was a dream, and said unto him. 
I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place, and he's talking about the temple, to myself for a house of sacrifice. 13. Now, the Lord gives him a, a hypothetical situation. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. In other words, if I do this, or if I command the locust to devour the land. Now, these things had happened before. Or if I send pestilence among my people. What's pestilence? Disease. It's what this world really is going through right now. The Lord's saying, if I do all these things. Now, hear this. Verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name. Now, who's called by his name today? What are they called? Jehovah's Witness. Don't be facetious. Oh, general term. Christian yeah. or God's children shall humble themselves. What does it mean to humble yourself? Get off your freaking high horse. You know, quit thinking that you're all it. And that you're not at the top of the food chain. <coughs> he is. You know, I mean, just like we have a wonderful marriage. But the thing is, she knows this, and, and same with me with her. We're not first in our marriage. God is. Because without him, we don't really have a marriage. We'll just be together. You know. But shall humble themselves and do what? And pray. pray. And there's another condition here. And seek my face. Well, how do you seek God's? Number one, we can't see God, right? Well, how do we seek his face? His word. Right here. We seek it out. We diligently seek it out. And, oh, there's another condition, yeah. And turn from their wicked ways. What's wicked ways? Sin. Turn from it. Now, we've all gone through sin. And guess what? Sin cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Those aren't my words. That's his words. Now, if you don't take that seriously, I feel sorry for you. Because God means what he means. But you see, because of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, you can have all your sins removed. It's simple for you. It wasn't simple for him. He gave it all. But if you repent, that's what it means. Pray, you repent, and then you go and remove that sin from your life. Meaning you don't go back to it. Now, sometimes we falter and we go back to the sin. Well, did you truly repent? Well, I said the words. You said the words, but you didn't truly repent. Truly repentance means what? A change of heart, a change of mind, a change of attitude. doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, depending on the sin. Sometimes it's difficult or a habit or something that's harmful to you that you've got to get rid of. But you can do it with him, with his help. Ask me how I know. <laughs> you know, I know this from a personal experience. And turn from their wicked ways. Then, now after you do this, then will I hear from heaven. <laughs> Beloved, not before. Then will I hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. In other words, you'll come in life where your cup will runneth over and over and over and over again. Abundance. Doesn't mean that you're going to be rich beyond your wildest dreams monetarily. But you will be rich beyond your wildest dreams in your heart and mind and be able to function in this world. No matter what this world is going through, 
you will be able to rise above it. But only this way. Only this way. That's why I keep this verse in my wallet. You know, I visit it every time I open my wallet, which isn't very often. <laughs> I'm being facetious daily. So, one must come to him on his terms, not our own. That's what this really results to. i got two more that I want to cover. I want to go to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Just a few verses here. My son, verse 1 says, My son, now this is wisdom speaking. And all wisdom, all good wisdom comes from our Father. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and, excuse me, hide up my commandments. What does that mean? Lay up. What does that mean? Put in your mind and in your heart my commandments with thee. Verse 2, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom. This is godly wisdom. His scriptures. And, see there's a stipulation here, apply thine heart to understanding. In other words, not just be a hearer, but a doer of the word. We can hear, we can sit here and we could month after month, year after year, uh, just keep hearing the word of God, but if we don't do anything with it, how does God know that we actually heard it? He wants us to do something. Yea, verse 3 says, If thou criest after knowledge, wouldn't this be diligently? And liftest up thy voice for understanding. You pray, Lord, I need to know. I, I need to know the right truth. Now, what do I mean by the right truth? Because there's just so much like what we were covering earlier. There's a lot of false doctrine out there. False preachers, false teachers. And how are we going to know that they're teaching false? Unless we open up the pages for ourselves. And allow the Word, allow God to teach us. Him teaching us. If, verse 4 says, If thou seekest her, this is wisdom and knowledge, as silver, and searcheth for her as for hid treasures. In other words, if it is as important to you as looking for a buried treasure. Five, if you do this, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. Again, knowing what fear means in the ancient language means what? Reverence. Reverence, which means love. Then shalt thou understand the love of the Lord. And, here it is, find the knowledge of God. You can find that knowledge in His Word. If you love Him, if you eagerly, enthusiastically, thoroughly, diligently seek Him. Not play games at it. Not just open it up like that family, blow the dust off the Bible. You know, when there's a death in the family, make an entry. Oh, we're being good Christians. No, that's not being a good Christian. Being a good Christian is opening up the Word. you got to feed your face daily. Well, guess what? You need to feed your soul daily as well. There's not a day in your life that you don't need the Word of God in it. Verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. You're not going to get this kind of wisdom anywhere else. Nowhere else from any other word. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And out of his mouth come these words. You see, and I, that's why it irks me so much when people say, well, this has been going on for thousands of years and so many people have written down the word. No, God has inspired every one of his words. You say, well, haven't you changed some of those words? No, I've never changed them. Somebody else did, like unicorn. But we're given the truth, aren't we? And where to find that truth, what unicorn means, and how to find it. 
One last place and we'll end there. Went to the old, I want to go to the new and end here today. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I want to go to verse 18. This is the final example I've been given. And a certain, verse 18, Mark, Luke 18, verse 18, And a certain ruler asked him, asked Jesus. Now this was a very, um, a merchant, had a lot of merchandise. Very wealthy man, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What's the meaning of life? How, how can I, how can I inherit eternal life? Nineteen. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is, God. What was he asking the man? I don't want to get too involved in this, but what was he asking the man of his knowledge? Did he have enough knowledge that he was talking to God? But be that as it may, the Lord continues. Twenty. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, this is the merchant, All these have I kept from my youth up. I've done these things. I've never gone, gone wrong on them. 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor. That means give it all away. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Now, I know some preachers that use this. Say, see there, you got to give the church everything. It's not what, if that's what you think this means, you completely don't understand it. First of all, we don't know how this man got all this merchandise. It could have been from ill-gotten gain for all we know. But also, what did he want him to do? Sell it all, give it to the poor, and that's it? No, he says, follow me. In other words, you do all this. Now, how could this man take all the merchandise that he had and follow Jesus everywhere that he went? Well, he couldn't do that, could he? Now, did the Lord say, sell all that you got, and give us the money? No. He didn't need the money, did he? As a matter of fact, he knew that he could feed thousands of people just by prayer. So, what did he want this man to do? He wanted to give up all his gain that he had gotten in the world and give it to the poor and then keep following Jesus. Well, it goes deeper into this. Listen. 23. And when he, this is the merchant, heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Now think about this. He was sorrowful that the Lord asked him to follow him, to be a part of his entourage, even, I guess, calling him to be a disciple. Whoa. But he sorrowful. Why? It's all stuff. See, he's got a lot of stuff. You know, like today... Well, my garage is full. I got a boat and a bike and cars and got a big house and I got all this stuff. You know, you want me to get rid of all of it? Now, let's not remember or forget. Where did he go in Capernaum? What house was he at? Peter's. Now, Peter was following him, wasn't he? Well, did the Lord ask Peter to get rid of his house? No, I think... This is basically the Lord knew this man's heart to begin with. Yeah. And he knew what would get him. He knew where, where his treasure lie in well, his heart. Also, he knew the hearts of the world mm -hmm. and where their treasures lie. Peter was probably just paying rent anyway. No, it was his house. Let's not forget, Peter was a commercial fisherman yeah, when the Lord came to him. You know this guy make a lot of money. Oh, he, he had enough money. He had a house. He had a business. 
That's more than a lot of people back in those days had. In other words, he didn't work for anybody but himself. Now listen, because it goes into that. Verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches, this is worldly riches, enter into the kingdom of God? Does that mean every rich person? No. Can't, no, it doesn't mean that every rich person it can't enter. Hard. Worldly riches. Listen. 25. He says, For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. What? Now, to those of you that haven't studied this, this might sound very strange. But back in the day... He's talking about Jerusalem and other cities, large cities. They had big walls around them. And in, in those big walls, there was a large gate, which was called like a commercial gate. People go in and out daily, you know, to conduct the business. Well, at night, they would close that big gate to keep marauders out and thieves out and whatever. But they would have this small, little, small gate off to the side that they could defend very easily, just uh, two or three people could get through this thing at a time. Now a camel with a big old pack on its back couldn't even go through it. The camel had to get down on its knees and unload all the pack and then go through the gate. That's what this needle gate is. So he's saying it's easier for that to happen than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. Now when he said this, remember his disciples are around him. Even Peter, who still had his house, right? 26. And they that heard it said, well, who then can be saved? You know, if, if this is the case, we're all doomed, you know. To which Jesus said in verse 27, and he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. You know, in other words, it's not possible for you to do it on your own. It's not possible for you to understand what I'm talking about without me giving you the information, me being the Lord. In other words, I've got to be able to come to you and tell you these things so that you'll understand them. But for you to receive that, you've got to diligently want my answer. Thoroughly, earnestly. Seek it out. Know in your heart, hey, the answers are here. You may not know what those answers are yet, but the answers are here. Because what did he tell us in his word? I have foretold you all things. That means diligently seek him to find the information that you need, not only to have eternal life, but to have peace in this flesh life. Even with all this stuff going on around us today, you can have peace. Right in the middle of it. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown in the fiery furnace. And the king says, well, didn't I throw p three people in there? And they go, well, yeah, Lord. And he says, well, I see four there. One looks like the Son of Man. Why? Because Jesus was there with them. And they came out of that fiery furnace without even a hair on their head singed. Didn't even smell like smoke. Why? Because Christ put his covering over them. For our example... Verse 28 says, Then Peter, remember, he was in Peter's house before. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Now, did Peter say, Well, I sold my house. No, his wife was there. I sold all my boats. Yeah. Remember, he was a commercial fisherman. Because let's not forget what Peter did after Christ's resurrection. He went back to fishing for a while, remember? Mm -hmm. They all went back to fish. They didn't know anything else to do. You know, but the thing, so it tells us he still had substance that he could fall back on. But then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. 29. And he, being Jesus, said unto them, Verily or truly I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake. 30, and this is why we came here. Mm -hmm. Who shall not receive manifold or many times more 
in this present time. Not in the eternal kingdom, but in your flesh existence. Shall, who shall not receive many fold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. In other words, now what is he telling us here? Well, I've got to leave my parents. I've got to leave my children. No. He's saying to leave them behind and, and you no. just go no. merrily off. What does he mean? Put the Lord first. You put the Lord first. You diligently seek him. He will lead. He will guide. He will direct you. But he's not telling you to give up your family, sell your home, sell everything that you own. Now, sometimes people are given that information to go out in the mission field and boom, boom, land. And they need the funds to go do that. The Lord has asked some to do that. As, but he doesn't ask everybody to do that. He doesn't. It's not a requirement. But what is a requirement is to diligently seek the Lord. So Thoroughly, earnestly, with all your heart. What are you shaking your head for? I was going to say, so basically what the richest thing is, is where these, the rich people, quote unquote, are putting their riches before the Lord. It doesn't matter whether it's ill-gotten gain or... Anything or, or anyone you put before God... Is, is going to be detrimental in your spiritual walk with Him. And that is why, beloved, that is why today, today, when you got all these people just freaked out, how in the world can you be freaked out when you've got God on your side? Well, the problem is, they could have God on their side, but they don't. Why? Because they're doing things their own way, not God's way. And don't tell me they are. They, they could sit there and stare me right in the face and say, Pastor Ron, you don't understand. I'm following the Lord with all my heart. Then why are you worried? Why in the world are you worried about anything? If you fully trust God. See, that's why he's the heart knower. And that's why we, we're not supposed to judge. Because believe me, believe me, I'm, and I'm praying earnestly on this, to not judge people. Because I really want to get in their face and start judging people. For their lack of understanding when they... I'm not talking about the heathen. I'm talking about Christians who are saying that they love the Lord, yet they're living in fear. Well, see, I, like I said, I go back to this. I was there. I spent about three days in that land yes, you did. because I was totally self-involved. I was not thinking with the Lord as far as leading me. I was thinking worldly. You know, I wasn't doing studies during those three days at all, and I was totally engrossed in social media, and I let it get to me. That was my flesh being weak. Now listen to what you just said. I want you all to hear what you just said. And I want you all to hear what I'm about to say. That is why we have pestilence today. Mm -hmm. That's what it said. That's why we have the virus today. Mm -hmm. To get people's attention. Exactly. It's not because he dislikes his children. He loves them. He wants to bring them to eternal peace. But if they're just la 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 in the world and just doing whatever they want to do, however they want to do it, and listen to all this and listen to all that instead of God, he pulls the cord a little bit tighter and says, look, this is happening. Well, some people say, well, what about all those people who died? Isn't that terrible? Depends on how you look at it. I don't think it's terrible. To me... When my flesh stops existing, I have just graduated. He said, well, what about those that graduated but didn't get on the right side of the gulf because of their disobedience? Hence the millennium. I still can't help but think, even on the other side of the gulf, is a whole heck of a lot better than what this world's going through right now. Because they're in spiritual bodies with no pain. No, they're not up there frying like a piece of bacon.
contrary to what some people are teaching. False doctrine. So, I'm out of time. Diligently seek the Lord. Now, next week, we're Lord willing. I'm still debating or waiting for the Lord to answer me, but I, I do want to teach about Pentecost. Um, but the last Saturday, I believe, of this month, I think there's a Saturday after Pentecost, right? Mm -hmm. There's no lecture. Don and I are going to be on vacation. And the first Saturday in June, we won't have a lecture because we'll just be coming back from vacation. But after that, we'll get involved in, a, I'm sure, another book. Um, but um, if I don't teach about um, uh, Pentecost, I think I just might, I don't know yet, teach about the word worry. Because there's so many people worrying. But I think we covered that pretty well today, didn't we? Are there any questions about what we covered? <coughs> about faith or about diligently seeking the Lord? All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord, for your teachings. You, you, you bring out, you reveal to us such importance. And it means everything to us. Because with you, we, we, we get through it all. All the way to eternity. And what we read now, what we study now, has, is never going to change. It's your word now and forever. And we thank you for that opportunity to be a part of that. I pray for everyone here today and their families and all those on YouTube and their families that you watch over us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. And forevermore, we will give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. And there's one last person I would like to pray for that I didn't put on the prayer request. I pray for our beloved Dennis Murray, mm. that he gets through his cancer. However you so choose. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. To God be the glory.